Hello, I'm here with Mariana Mazzucato, who is a professor in the Economics of Innovation at the University of Sussex. Mariana, thanks for being with me today. Thank you. Uh, we are here discussing the Economics of Innovation. What does that actually mean to you? Well, to be honest, I'm particularly interested in what it means to talk about the process of innovation. Yeah. So. Um, in my work, uh, both in my book, but also in some recent work I've been doing with Bill Azonik, we really focus on three characteristics of innovation. Mm -hmm. That it's very collective, it's extremely uncertain, and it's cumulative. And those three characteristics actually tell us a lot about both how innovation is done, but also all the things that can go wrong. Now, the book, in case you're wondering, it's called The Entrepreneurial State. Um, it's an interesting title. Uh, certainly, the libertarians wouldn't like to hear about it because uh, there is this general perception that um, these innovations have uh, happened through the wonders of the free market and that the state has had absolutely no role mm. in regard to fostering the innovation. But you challenge that prevailing perception. Yes, and actually, I challenge it even with, um, if you want, amongst progressives, mm. because at best, you know, when we're not just talking about the state as an impediment and a meddler in the innovation process, but at best, when we talk about it as having a role, mm. but that role is very limited to just creating the the conditions for innovation, mm -hmm. where then that private sector does its you know crazy innovative thing, or put another way, um, using economic speak, when it's fixing different types of market failures mm -hmm. like public good problem, you know basic research, it's a public good, it's very hard to appropriate the returns from that, and hence the state, most people agree, has to fund basic research. Mm -hmm. What I talk about is the state as being an entrepreneurial state, because what I say is actually the state in the few countries and the few regions within these countries that have actually achieved innovation-led growth, the state has done much more than just fixing markets, it has actually actively shaped and created markets. And really, only Polanyi, uh, Karl Polanyi, who was a historian slash sociologist, talked about that. But the degree to which we can understand what that means within economics is the real challenge today if we want to talk about innovation in a sensible, non-ideological way. It's, it seems unavoidable, especially when you're dealing with the economics of innovation. I know you've discussed it. Bill Janeway has discussed it as well. But there, there, and, and, and in the US, there is this, uh, it's, it's the dirty little secret that, that, that even though we don't like to talk about industrial policy, it's a mm. four-letter word, uh, um, uh, it, it is. Been, it has been a very important component of economic growth, and arguably our economic decline set in when we started getting the, this Reagan-esque notion that um, um, the, the government that governs the least uh, yep. gov governs best, uh, that the, we just need to get the state out of the way, and that became the prevailing ideology in the 1980s. Mm. Well, what's, what's really interesting with Reagan, mm. and actually Fred Block tells this story quite well, is that whereas both Reagan and Thatcher tried to sort of chip away at the state, Reagan at least did not chip away at the innovation budget. It has actually been rising basically up until now, and today there's a big threat to the uh, competitiveness of um, of the United States, and a recent New York Times article that was reviewing my book actually said, hey, Obama, watch out. You're mm -hmm. actually cutting innovation spending in order to appease you know, people who are so worried about our debt, but you're basically going to you know, kill the US's uh, um, capability to compete with, say, China, which is actually increasing its R&D spending by 170%. But just getting back to sort of what we were talking about before, so mm -hmm. the answer is that actually what the state has done in places like Silicon Valley mm -hmm. has been, uh, first of all, it wasn't driven just by correcting market failures. It was really mission-oriented finance from putting a man on the moon in the past to you know, solving climate change today. It required massive budgets. So the National Institutes of Health just last year, in order to feed the you know, innovation economy within life sciences in the US, spent $32 billion just for that one sector. So lots of money, but also you know, through all sorts of different agencies, has actually been very active across the entire innovation chain, from basic research, applied research, and early stage seed financing. But to be honest, I'm almost tired about talking about innovation because mm -hmm. to me that's not the point. To me, yep. that's just a historical fact, yep. and you know, I, I you know do go around and I kind of feel like I'm on a mission. Thank you for indulging us <laughs> again. But let's no, no, talk. No. <laughs> no, but I'll tell you what I mean by that. Yep. So my big point in the book is to say, hey, so what does this mean? You know, so if it's true that the state has taken this you know extreme risk because that's the whole point. Innovation is you know an example of Nike uncertainty. You know, mm -hmm. most R and D projects fail. For every Tesla. There's 10 cylinders, right? And yep. both Tesla and Solyndra recently got from the US government a 500 million guaranteed loan, which is extremely risky, as we know, with the Solyndra outcome. Um, for every internet, you have 10 Concords. I mean, I could just sort of you know, mm -hmm. go down the list. For every time we hear that the government picked the wrong technology, there's all sorts of you know, uh, successful technologies that the government has, in fact, picked. The real question then is, 
how, you know, what do we do about this problem? So we, we're basically saying the government has socialized risks, mm -hmm. right? It has taken on the biggest risk in terms of in any sector, the highest capital intensity and the highest technological market risk. It has become the loss leader, in effect, in many well, other industries. The what? The loss leader. The loss, the, leader. The, the loss leader in the in the in the sense that it it, 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 it has taken the, the, a lot of the big, the, the big risks to, and absorbed yeah. the early uh, early stage losses yeah. that one associates with early stage. But then the question, okay. Yeah. But then the question is, why are we only socializing the risks and not mm. the rewards? Yeah. And my big interest is both in a practical level, how do we reform this dysfunctional dynamic? How do we also socialize the rewards? But also. Um, you know, sort of unpicking the narrative that has actually accompanied uh, this this capacity to extract value. And mm -hmm. this is actually the research I'm doing with Bill Lazonic. So, you know, in our recent paper called Risks and Rewards, uh, you know, Understanding the Innovation and Inequality Relationship, our take on why you have innovation and inequality often hand in hand is not so much the question about skills. You know, the skill bias technological change is a problem. Lots of people do get left behind without the appropriate skills. That policy space obviously means that government and private firms should be you know, thinking about training workers so they're not left behind. Mm -hmm. However, this extreme level of inequality, which people like Piketty talk about, mm -hmm. and he very specifically says the return on capital has been you know, too high compared to the rate of growth, that return on capital has actually been increasing alongside a narrative about innovation, who the mm -hmm. innovators are. So this idea that somehow Silicon Valley was, was you know, the outcome of, say, the venture capital industry mm -hmm. has facilitated particular financial agents to constantly sort of lobby for lower capital gains. Don't forget, it was actually the National Venture Capital Association that in 1976 convinced government um, in just five years to reduce capital gains tax from 40% to 20% those kinds of changes in tax, there's almost no evidence they affect you know, spending on innovation, that kind of investment, which is actually driven by the perception of where the new technological market opportunities are, which are highly correlated to this kind of public spend. But those changes in tax and, and certainly de variations in tax, global tax rates, uh, um, do have an impact in terms of the revenues that governments can collect. And you and, you and Bill uh, recently wrote a piece uh, uh, documenting the, the uh, practices of, of Apple, for example. Yes, uh, perfectly legal, uh, um, and, and, yeah. and, and no one can blame Apple for taking advantage of a, of a, of a system that actually uh, um, is, is, is out there legally for them to use. But it, but it, well, but it is, it is somewhat hypocritical in the sense that you have these companies that say, we're not funding the right kinds of, uh, uh, we're not yeah. funding education adequately, and, yeah. uh, and, and um, you know, we're not giving enough uh, help to give us the type of workers we need, and yet they are, are creating the very conditions which help to create this underfunding. Yeah, I'm just trying to find this graph, which is the one I'm most proud of in this book. Mm -hmm. um, I'll find it later. Uh, which just shows how every single technology behind, anyway, no, we'll find it there. <laughs> every single technology behind the iPhone that actually makes that phone a smartphone and not a stupid phone was actually funded by government. So internet, GPS, touchscreen display, the Siri voice activated system, which is interesting because when people have attacked Apple or Amazon or Google about not paying tax, at best we hear, oh, but they're using our roads, our infrastructure, our educated workforce. And I'm, and you know, I've been saying, yeah, and, all the technology in their products was actually funded by government. Mm -hmm. So um, the real question for Apple and Google, you know, Google's algorithm was funded by the National Science Foundation, is who's going to fund the next Apples and the next Googles without, if you want, the kind of budgets we used to have. And those budgets actually were obviously related um, to both tax rates, but also the details within those taxes. But maybe the real question is not who's going to fund it, because it does seem the government will continue to fund, but maybe mm -hmm. the question, but maybe, the, well, it's being cut back. But National Science Foundation today has a major budgetary problem. ARPA-E is constantly being told that it should maybe just focus on basic and not applied research, because that's the public mm -hmm. good, that's the market failure, why are you doing all this applied research? Um, well, you know, to be honest, even in the UK, the BBC, which is one of, you know, a very innovative public broadcasting agency, which uh, invested in the iPlayer, which is this internet platform for um, broadcasting its radio and TV, it gets attacked as well of, you know, being sort of too active. Um, you know, you're a public sector agency. Why are you investing in internet stuff? You know, mm -hmm. that should have been outsourced. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the really big points, actually, for any public sector organization that in order to do this kind of thing that you know, we're trying to describe of the state actually having played a lead role in innovation. How do you attract the kind of expertise and talent? How do you remain, uh, you know, nimble and uh, flexible and not fear failure, but welcome it? Those are organizational issues. And the more you invest in your own capacity building, 
capabilities, the better able you're going to be to do that. And today, part and parcel of attacking the state is that you know lots of people do just want to go work in Google or Goldman Sachs, God forbid, mm. instead of working in a public sector agency. Because we're describing the public sector as this inertial dinosaur bureaucracy. And so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, I think uh, to the, the other point I was going to make was that uh, you describe a situation where um, you know, the government uh, invests in a, in a lot of different industries. Uh, there's a lot of losers, but there are, as you've pointed out, winners as well. But they don't seem to uh, get any returns from that. Exactly. In, in, in the sense that, uh, you know, the, 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 there is the argument, of course, well, they are getting the returns because these companies pay corporate income tax. Yeah. But of course, you point out that's not actually happening. And in many instances, they're, they're, they're yeah. not getting any kind of near the return for the re relative to, to what they invested in these companies. Yes. And so in, at the end of the book, I actually talk about specific types of tools that could be used to actually you know, um, also get some of the upside profits and not just the downside losses mm -hmm. in order to fund the losses, but also the next round of investments. And that would include retaining equity. It could include um, you know, retaining some sort of golden share of the IPR. Mm -hmm. The use of income contingent loans, we use that with students. Why not you know, with companies? And the really interesting thing, though, is that actually, if you look at, um, for example, what, what just happened with Tesla Motors. Mm -hmm. So again, government gave it a 500 million guaranteed loan loan, and in that sort of contract, it actually said that government was going to be allowed to buy, I think it was 3 million shares, um, when the price of the Tesla shares were really still low. It was something like uh, $9 a share when the loan was given. Um, once the loan was paid back in 2013, the price was already in the 90s. I think it was like 96 per share. And the question is, why didn't then the government exercise that right? And we also see it with IPR policy patent policy mm -hmm. in the Beidol Act, which in the 1980s um, allowed publicly funded research to actually be patented mm -hmm. um, in order to <clears throat> foster commercialization. In that act, it says, well, you know, we don't want to make the taxpayer pay twice for the research and then for, you know, really high prices, say, of drugs. So the government should have or does, you know, should have in those cases the ability also to have a say on the price, right? Because this is government funded sort mm -hmm. of products, research. Um, and so in order to prevent the taxpayer from paying twice, we have to, you know, make sure that the price just doesn't go crazy. And the government has never exercised that right. And by contrast, uh, so there's a power problem. It is a power problem. Let, let, let's shift gears for one moment because there was another very interesting fact which you uh, pointed out in the, uh, in the book, and it, re it comes in relation to state funding. Uh, one country which does still believe that is China, mm. uh, and you pointed out that uh, the, the, I think it's the China Development Bank alone spends more on uh, 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 research and development for green technologies than uh, uh, most of the uh, the, the U.S. Uh, yeah. So. What, exactly. So, and it's not just the China Development Bank. There's four very active banks. It's the China Development Bank, the Brazilian Development Bank, the KfW, which is Germany's development bank, and the European Investment Bank. Just those four banks alone are spending, um, I think, something like eight times as much as the entire worldwide uh, private sector. So, private equity, venture capital, stock market, and corporate investments in the let's just call it clean technology space. And what's fascinating about that is that these are banks. Okay, so it's not the DARPA or mm -hmm. ARPA E's. Um, it's you know public banks, which also have a Keynesian role, right? Yeah. So they are also trying to have counter cyclical credit when you have recessions. Private banks retract or you know go back and are are not um, you know funding the real economy. And so these banks come in and increase the credit. They also have a Minskian kind of role in terms of the capital development of the economy. But what we're seeing today is that these banks are increasingly also having this Schumpeterian role of funding these kind of mission-oriented big new areas, whether it's life sciences or clean technology. And because we don't have a framework through which to understand that, and that's you know, the previous point, that it's not about market failures, it's this mission-oriented finance, um, then we don't even have a way to evaluate their performance. So they do end up getting accused of, say, crowding out. Mm -hmm. Okay, when we don't even understand how, you know, even the whole crowding in, crowding out terminology and framework wasn't even devised to talk about this kind of frontier pushing, uh, you know, creation of markets. The crowding in, at best, is talking about a period when you have, you know, underutilized resources, low interest rates. The idea is you get government to come in, which, you know, increases the pie of savings mm -hmm. for both the public and the private sector. So there's no crowding out, there's crowding in. That framework was not devised to talk about 
the sort of active investments in new technologies, which creates new markets that don't even exist there and, in the first place. And given place. the scale of the state investment, we should probably in the next uh, 15, 20 years see, expect to see a quantum leap in, in, in green technology innovation, for example, in places like China. Yeah, but also huge profits to be made. So yeah. this is the idea that, you know, currently you have the private sector still very scared about that part of the clean tech area, which is still very uncertain, very capital intensive. But what we will probably see, as we saw with biotech and nanotech and the internet, is that after the entrepreneurial state has sort of absorbed this high uncertainty, they do then enter. Mm -hmm. And what I'm telling governments, because I, I sort of have been traveling around the world, um, talking to different governments that are interested in this uh, issue, you know, about how do we even think about these policies, to be careful, you know, don't repeat the same mistake. You know, you, ha you are, in theory, trying to make these investments. There's no reason that you shouldn't also be, if you want, recouping some of the rewards to fund the next round. So the provocative way I put it is, you know, had the U.S. government thought about this a bit, some of the profits from the whole internet uh, economy could be funding today the green tech investments. Well, it's a, uh, it's a discouraging note to think that we, 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 we have not reclaimed the idea of the entrepreneurial state here in the United States, uh, and, and, and it will sounds like it will be much to our cost. But Mariana, there's, there's loads more I'd love to talk to you about, but we've run out of time. Okay. And, uh, but I very much appreciate uh, your contribution to the scholarship in this area, what you've done at the conference, and, um, uh, and your friendship. So thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Thank mm -hmm. you very much.